Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday webinar uh, with Property uh, Law Alliance. Um, it's so good to have you all uh, with us, back with us, Bruno and Silna. Always a pleasure. I know it's my first time and I'm saying always a pleasure. But that's because <laughs> I watch you guys intently. Um, I tune in every Wednesday for the shows. And uh, I know that uh, I look forward to them and I'm sure the viewers as well look forward to them. Um, so it's good to be back. 2020 was a ridiculous year, to say the least. So yes, to hoping for a better 2021. Um, how are you doing, Stella? I am very good, thank you. Thank you so much. It's so, um, it's a new year, uh, you know, new everything, a new host on the, on the Property Law Alliance. Thank you so much um, for hosting us. Otherwise, everybody is stuck with just Bruno and I, and I think uh, we're sometimes boring. Um, we think, we like to think we're pleasant, and entertaining but you know um but so thank you um no i'm really well really looking forward to this year uh, like you said 2020 was uh, was something and i think we really uh, learned so much from 2020 that i can't wait to see what uh, 2021 does for us no of course of course of course it's good 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 to see you again so now before <laughs> i introduce you. myself uh, bruno how how are you doing how was how was your your break uh, if you did go on one and um, yeah. yeah, I'm good. Um, ready for 2021, I suppose. Um, yeah, it's it's good to to start a new year. And yeah, also I'd like to welcome you. Um, I've known you for quite a while, so it's really good to have you on. And yeah, it's a it's a good start to the year. Hello, lovely. Um, so to introduce myself, my name is Christopher Abrams, and uh, I'm going to be joining Bruna and Solna on this journey as we journey with all of you. Um, so it's good to be here. Uh, I um, worked with Bruno for quite some time and I also obviously follow Solna as well. So yeah, it's good to be in the company that I am in currently. So thank you guys. Um, I think let's just get underway quickly with one or two of uh, the questions that were asked um, on the page in the group. Um, I see there's quite some, there's some interesting questions here. So the first question is, um, should one insist on approved building plans in order to make a well-calculated offer when signing an OTP. If the seller doesn't make the approved plan available upfront before the offer is made, what recourse will I have if I sign the OTP without them later um, finding a portion of the building um, isn't approved by the municipality? So if a portion of that plan isn't approved by the municipality. Um, I'm not sure if Bruno, if you wanna take a dig at this one. Sure. Um, so it's actually quite an interesting one because I remember when I was scrolling through the group at a point, uh, it did. It, it, there was another question. I don't know if it was by the same individual, or somebody else, but also dealing with how the OTP should be structured. So my my thing with this is we this question would have to be divided into two, because the first portion of the question is what happens after the fact. Um, when yeah. you've just signed the OTP, you haven't paid enough attention or rather not paid enough attention, but you haven't worried about it. Maybe you didn't know you're supposed to worry about it. And now you realize there's something wrong. And what if you do try and undertake some level of due diligence and what should you put in the, in the OTP? So Solna, which one do you want? And I'll do that. <laughs> I, I like the, the due diligence part. I, li okay. I, I like the, the conversation around why do we want building plans and uh, how do we get it before ideally we sign an OTP? Okay, cool. Well then, then you can go first and then I'll end <laughs> with that. How, how do you get out of this once, once it's happened? <laughs> I played it very well, right? I took the, the first, <laughs> the first part. Well, the, the thing is, Bruno, I, I, I think you'll agree with me on this. I think personally, I wouldn't buy anything without the, uh, seeing approved building plans. So, so what's important to, to realize, and I think many people might not be aware of this, but if, if you buy a property with portions built onto the property that's not part of approved building plans, you can't do anything with that. And the problem is the only way to remedy that problem is to get an architect, because remember it has to be signed off by an architect, to get an architect to approve the plans mm -hmm. and sign, then it has to go to your city council, 
they have to approve it while your municipality, not everybody lives in cities, sorry, as Joe Burkett, uh, says the girl from Middleburg in Pumalanga, and now I'm like, <laughs> only city council. But anyway, <laughs> so something uh, that's something very important because the thing is, you're not going to find an architect that's going to sign off on plans that's already been built. If it was an architect that uh, that drew up the original plans, they would obviously sign the plans, take it to the municipality to be approved before you start building. So the truth is, let's just quickly call a spade a spade for the lack of a better term here, the kind of things that are built onto a property without proper plans are built by a bucky builder. And as much mm -hmm. as we love bucky builders and they do amazing jobs, most of the times those plans aren't approved and might not be safe. And you can have a very big problem. The truth is the best way then very often is unfortunately to demolish and get the plans approved and then rebuild Potentially the same thing. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've seen LAPA after LAPA after mm. Bry area uh, that had to be demolished because you can't get plans approved because there isn't an architect out there that will sign off um, on plans that's already been built. Mm. So due diligence, um, uh, to go back to that, I wouldn't buy a property without approved plans and I wouldn't sign an offer to purchase without approved plans but to hold a property so now I'm look at me now I look at me how I'm going to jump a queue now because I said I'll take the due diligence plot and now I'm already jumping to the to a solution but I'll, I'll leave it now for you Bruno I promise but my suggestion is always to have due diligence as part of a suspensive condition in an offer to purchase, allow yourself time to do due diligence as a, as a potential purchaser without running the risk of losing um, the deal. So give yourself time, but also keep in mind that you don't want to mess with the seller here. It, you can't use due diligence as an excuse to find someone you can sell the property onto. You want to use due diligence as, as exactly that. When it's a suspensive condition and you allow yourself time to, to do due diligence, for instance, getting approved building plans, the seller is fully aware of the fact that if he doesn't uh, uh, provide you with the approved plans within the time period that you give fully 10, 15, whatever amount of days to do that, he's going to lose the transaction. So what I always say is just make sure you put the ball in the correct court. If you have the ball in your court for due diligence and you're hanging out with it nah, 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 on, on your side of the, of the field, um, you can't put any pressure on the seller to, to do what he has to do. So to have it as a, a um, suspensive condition is definitely my recommendation. But on due diligence, just to you know, take the conversation a little further, not just around building plans, but due diligence will involve a lot more. Due diligence definitely will include a proper inspection. And I know I'm a pain about this. You've heard me say this a million and a half times. Before you put in an offer to purchase, especially for investment purposes, please, please seriously consider getting a, a qualified, actual proper building inspector. Because you can invest in property for years. You're not going to know if a foundation isn't done properly. I don't know about you, but I've never been in a ceiling in my life. You know why? Because it's hot and there's dust and there's probably going to be a rat. And I don't want to look like a pansy shouting when there's a rat running, you know, of my feet. Yeah. It's not pretty. Um, so I've never been in a ceiling and you need to get into ceilings. You need to know what's happening on foundations before you put in an offer. And you can't do that, in fairness, in a, a quick viewing with an estate agent. So give yourself time, but, but, but only give yourself that time if you're really serious about the deal. Get a, a professional inspector out, get the building plans, know that it's been approved. Don't fall for the, I can't get the plans. 
um, then at least ask for an actual uh, for actual proof yeah. that the person is trying to get the approved plans. Um, and due diligence go much further than that. Obviously, you go to lease agreements if there's somebody in occupation. And don't buy a property with a tenant in occupation without actually having a read through the lease agreement. Because yeah. somebody might tell you that it's an amazing tenant. Yeah, duh, they want to sell the property. Get the lease agreement. Do full due diligence. Do a credit check. Check on TPN what the payment behavior is. And you can do all of that if you allow yourself enough time to do that. I think I took the due diligence thing much further, but I think I've covered it. <laughs> no, that was beautiful. Uh, that was beautiful. Thank you, Selna. Um, Bruno, I'm not sure if Selna left anything there in that for you to discuss. But, I'll find uh, it. There's a few little breadcrumbs <laughs> here and there. I can. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so, I, I, so I, I'm guessing with the building inspector, we're probably speaking about our common friend Marisha and her stories about climbing into roofs. Um, but, but it's actually it's actually incredible because when you do have a conversation with someone like her. And I mean, like when we were together last year at that year in function, chatting to her, the, 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 the funniest thing is the building plans aren't in themselves some kind of warranty. And now I'm also going to touch on both questions. I'm going to do what Silna did and kind of take a little bit out of both. But uh, I think the perception of what a building plan entails might be where the misconception mm -hmm. is. Building plans aren't warranties. It's not like you get building plans and you go, that's brilliant. The house is built perfectly right they're a good indication of it don't get me wrong so the fact that there are building plans is that step that's needed because if there aren't building plans there's almost a like 70 percent chance the building's not built properly at least with building plans you know you kind of have placed this reliance on something that's been approved by an engineer at some point or another but the reality is when taking somebody out to the property like a building inspector you're going to find that there's building plans, but the house, there's still things falling apart. There's damp issues, there's cracks, there's climbing to ceilings, there's a lack of maintenance. So sometimes that has nothing to do with building plans. Sometimes it actually has to do with the fact that the person's lived there for 50 years, but hasn't done anything uh, to maintain the property. So that kind of just echoes what Silna was chatting about regarding due diligence. Uh, people do tend to exploit the due, due diligence clause where they make a huge provision of time but then they use it for other reasons, other purposes. At the very least, guys, use it for the reason why it's there as well, because the reality is you might actually need it. Um, and I think this goes back to that, uh, to that story. I don't know if I've said it before, but one of my clients bought a property on auction, a share of sale, and he bought it and he used to flip property. So very quickly sold it on to somebody else. Um, when that person moved into the property, stayed there a couple of months, and then it completely flooded when the rain started. And what so it was at the bottom of a panhandle. And what was actually happening there was there was no drainage at all. The water was seeping into the foundations. And they obviously came after my client to say, you know, look at what you sold me. And the reality is my client didn't know either because he saw it bought it in winter at a sheriff's sale and execution and flipped it almost entire, uh, like almost immediately. And, and things like that, things like that happen. And I, you know, there might even be building inspectors that wouldn't pick that up, but you as a lay person are not going to guess that there's insufficient drainage in, in an area like that. So it's just like use what you can as much as possible. Um, and then when it comes to the after effect, so Solna says, submit the OTP, put a suspensive condition in, buy yourself time, and make sure that you get everything in place. Now, what happens if you haven't done that? You're a lay person, you go in, you make the offer, you're, you don't know any better. So this might be a debate between attorneys. Maybe it is. I mean, Solna, you're always welcome to disagree with me. I, I, I look forward to it. But <laughs> with me, <laughs> with me um, building plans are... Oh, uh, like they're almost a form of warranty because there's an expectation. Uh, it's, it's, it's tested or implied in the contract that if you're selling this property, that there are going to be building plans. And not even on a footstool level, because to a certain degree, 
the footsteps is kind of different to this because building plans, they're either legal or they're not legal. The construction of a property would be illegal without it. So it goes beyond, yeah, but there's a couple of things that need repairs, but you buy it as is. Uh, building plans are kind of a big one. So my argument is if it's a private sale, so maybe with a sheriff, it's different, but as a private sale mm -hmm. between a seller and a purchaser, there is an expectation and almost an implied warranty that there are building plans. So if you find yourself in a situation where you've taken transfer and there aren't building plans, there is recourse against the seller. And also bear in mind that this isn't a question of does a CPA apply because I'm now working on the premise that there is no CPA. As soon as a CPA applies, then without a doubt, there's recourse. Um, mm -hmm. So the fact that there aren't building plans is kind of a big one, but remember the downside. After you take transfer of the property, you want to go try chase a seller to pay you uh, and building plans and reconstruction, because like Silna mentioned, sometimes you have to demolish um, and, and rebuild. Sometimes you have to get the engineers out, the architects to put plans together. You need to do the submissions. This all costs money. Now you're going to try to chase the seller to get that money back. It's really, it, I don't think it's worth it. I think rather do the job properly at the beginning and not take the chance and know that there's recourse at the end. But to what end? Um, mm -hmm. How long is it going to take you? And uh, I love what you're saying, uh, Bruno. I'm in in interrupting right there. Uh, Shane, uh, Chris, I'm sorry. No, no, it's first evening of hosting, and I'm already running away. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, <annoying>. but, <laughs> but the thing is, Bruno, I, I actually had this conversation with a client today um, on a, a, a real rental. The, which, which isn't now, I mean, even close to the conversation we're having, but around judgments, and I think it's a very important question to have. Mm. Um, the, the perception of, but you can get a judgment. Mm. So yes, as the purchaser, you will have a damages claim. Well, you might have a damages claim mm. against mm. the seller, but I think what, what a lot of people don't understand, and I don't want to labor this point too much, but I think it's an important conversation to have is a, a court order or a judgment doesn't mean money in your bank account. What, what I would love to see, and I'm seriously, I think that'd be amazing if it weren't unconstitutional, but an ATM where you can pop in your court order and they draw money straight from that person's account. That'd be lovely if it wasn't like against every single potential law we like have. Like an insurance fund, that would actually be really great. Let's call it on this whole property law thing and we'd rather do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay so okay guys it's been real <laughs> have a good time <laughs> um, no but but the thing is i think people still have this perception that a court order means you're gonna get the money and the very sad truth is mm. that is not the case at all uh, mm. not even almost and i think we all as as uh, as attorneys are seeing it more and more and more so the process of execution it means that you're going to have to uh, you take your court order to court and you issue a warrant of execution mm -hmm. then the sheriff has to go out the attorney isn't allowed to go out with the sheriff on the execution i mean surely if you ask politely you can but it's going to end up costing the client even more mm -hmm. if you have to pay your attorney to walk through and see what we can attach that's the sheriff's job and mm -hmm. we as attorneys doesn't know what's happening in the premises. Why? Because we don't hang out uh, during executions because we don't have time and it's going to be way too expensive um, for your clients if you have to go to every execution. Mm. And then you still have interpleader proceedings, which means a third party can say, no, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. We can't sell Silna's most amazing flower cup. It belongs to me. Um, mm. and, and it's a lot of things. And most of the time, if you attach on, on residential property, so at somebody's residence, there isn't much of value. And when you sell that on a sheriff auction, mm. which is your only option, I, I, I wish most people, before they go through the process of litigation to obtain a court order, just attend one sheriff sale. It's going to frighten the living daylights out of you. It's so uber entertaining. I, I, unfortunately, um, my dear business partner, Nick, uh, put a ban on me going to share of sales because I get very <laughs> excited at any auction. My arm just keeps on popping up and then I end up buying the most amazing crap <laughs> that, that nobody can ever use. But I get, I get the auction 
overwhelmed and I buy stuff, but um, you're not going to get your money. So, and so yeah. to Bruno's point is just because you are in a position to claim from the seller doesn't mean you're going to get your money back. So don't bank on, but at least I have legal recourse. Mm. Don't fall into something. Mm. Uh, mm. keep, keep your money in your pocket until mm. you know it's a good deal. The moment mm. you let it go, it's, it's out of your hands and mm. you might get your money back at a later stage, but there's mm. no guarantee, even absolutely. if we can guarantee that you're going to get a judgment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, Sorry, I yeah, no, I know. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to touch on something that both of you raised. Um, the, the, the issue of, let's say, for instance, you have approved building plans for a particular property. Now, there are some dodgy operators out there in terms of architects and engineers who would pass plans that they have not themselves drafted or had sight of. Um, in that particular instance, where you have the plans, the plans are there, the, the seller is letting you know, yeah, I've got the plans, and you, when you take when transfer happens and you occupy the property, you discover that, wait, something is just not right here. And you, mm. then you discover that, okay, these plans were these plans were just hastily approved by some architect who didn't really care much for his reputation. I know you spoke about Silna now touching on the, the issue of recourse, but I, I think this is just something that I wanted to explore because I had a particular situation where my neighbor did this. My neighbor had a back room. He, did, he was selling his house, didn't have the plans, and just approached um, a, a, a friend of his to approve the plans. Plans mm -hmm. were then approved uh, somehow. I don't know how they were, but somehow they got the whole, whole of those plans. And uh, they started having structural, structural difficulties with that, that particular back room. Now, the plans are there, but they, 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 they are not worth the paper that I think they mm -hmm. were drafted on. What's your mm -hmm. opinion on that? Not to repeat anything that we've already touched on, but but what 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 would we do in a situation like that? I suppose I suppose the problem or what we need to consider is to what to what extent were they approved? Because remember, plans get approved by council, so one one has to go that far. So there might be dodgy architects and dodgy engineers, but it needs to go like the whole nine yards. Uh, to get council approval. And by the time you get those plans back, if they're not council approved, then they're not approved building plans so to begin with. So that's that's already the first thing that a person needs to consider is just getting an architect that, to design something and sign it off and say, well, here you go. That's not sufficient. Uh, that's not sufficient from a proof perspective. Um, there may be scenarios, for instance, where, you know, council approved it and unwittingly or yeah not knowing yes. that the engineer signed it off or the architect signed it off and they shouldn't have signed it off um, yes. i think there it is an unfortunate situation because again as a purchaser you get stuck with the i have recourse and in that instance i mean from a recourse perspective sure you could probably go you know, professionally after the architect and the engineers uh, I mean, the fact is they committed fraud. So, I mean, that's criminal charges against them. Um, the seller, if they knew about this, that's even worse. Um, I mean, you could do anything. For, but you could even possibly cancel the transaction. I suppose, again, it comes down to the difficulties with enforcement. Canceling a transaction and trying to return transfer of the property in exchange for the purchase price that you paid is going to be remarkably difficult. Mm -hmm. um, there are things, for example, like the NHBRC that one could possibly look at this being like an insurance, uh, insurance cover for new builds. So if the property is within that realm where it's being newly built, um, you know, the, but then the builder needs to be registered with the NH, NHBRC. And I mean, if we're talking about, you know, possibly dodgy architects and things like that, I highly doubt we've, been, you know, we got to a point where that is the case. But it's definitely something to look at. Okay. I think if, if I can add my 10 cents as I tend to, um, <laughs> the, the, if, it, if it is an actual registered architect, engineer, all, all those people, at least like us, they have professional indemnity insurance. Indemnity, yeah. so, so if he then dropped the ball, that's very different then from a normal court order. Then you just need to prove um, that they signed and they made a mistake, bona fide or uh, in Malafi days, and the, at least you have insurance, PI insurance covering you there. Um, so at least 
I must say, I would be more comfortable if I have to choose a bit of a situation. I'd be more comfortable with that sitting with the architect than yeah, with the seller. Mm -hmm. 100%. No, thanks, 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 guys, for that. Um, I'm going to quickly move on to a very interesting question here. And I find this very interesting because very often when you are on the market for a new house or an apartment, whatever it may be, a new property that you want to purchase, um, you go onto the market and you look and you're like, oh, I like that. So you sign an offer to purchase. And then you're like, wait, wait, wait. No, I like that one better. Or your wife gets involved or your husband gets involved <laughs> and the children get involved. And before you know it, you're sitting with 10 offers to purchase, right? You're sitting with all of these now. <laughs> And the question is, if you sign an offer to purchase and you never buy the house or the property, right. are you liable to pay the agent fee? So um, I think, Solna, maybe you want, to, you want to address this one and then Bruno, you can, you can give us um, your, your take on this particular situation as well. I think that the, start, the starting point on the answer is don't get anybody else involved. Make up your mind <laughs> and exclude anybody else. Just close your ears and start singing. Um, that's not practical. It's going to depend on the offer to purchase. Mm. So in terms of the Alienation of Land Act, uh, it's very clear. An offer to purchase ha will have to be in writing and signed by both parties. So how it normally works is the purchaser makes the offer. The offer is open for acceptance by the seller for a certain amount of time. Usually your OTP will say that it's an irrevocable offer. What that means is you can't say, no, thank you. I don't want it anymore. It's done since you are in, you've made this offer. And should the seller accept that offer, it's a legally binding contract. And unless there is a clause that allows you um, to exit in a way at a certain time period, or if there's a suspensive condition, for instance, as we've discussed, or a suspensive condition that allows you to obtain a bond or something, if, if those factors aren't part of your agreement, if those terms aren't part of your agreement, you have a legally binding contract. And if you do not um, act in terms of that agreement, for instance, you don't pay or you don't sign the transfer documents or whatever, either party that's, that's involved in that will then have the right to either uh, place you on terms to compel you to, to perform in terms of the agreement and then if you don't, they can choose whether they want to cancel the agreement and claim damages or whether they want to go for specific performance. Now, in an offer to purchase, my recourse, if you want to sell the property to that party, I would always rather recommend that you go for specific performance mm. rather than cancellation if you have the time to go through a high court application uh, to, to obtain an order for specific performance. Mm. But that wasn't the question. The question was agent commission. Once again, that's going to depend on the, um, on the offer to purchase. So remember, the mandate agreement is between the agent and the seller. So the seller is liable for payment of agent commission. However, there's usually a clause in the agreement that says, should the purchaser be responsible for the non-completion or non-execution of the particular contract, he will be responsible to pay the agent commission if commission is payable and earned on conclusion of the agreement or on fulfillment of the suspensive conditions. And if that happens, the purchaser will be liable for agent commission and um, it's, it's uh, going to be the way it is that the agent will have a claim against the, the mm. purchaser. What I want to add to this, Bruno, before I pass the ball to you again, um, is remember guys, the property industry is about this big. If you're a property investor, if you're a first time buyer, uh, or just you're buying for, for your house, this is where you're gonna live, that's cool and you can mess up your reputation as much as you want. If you're a property investor, I, I kid you not, the industry is much smaller than you think. And if you um, sign a bunch of offers and you try to sneak out of commission there with agents, Unfortunately, you're going to make enemies quite quickly and your reputation, unfortunately, I've seen this so many times uh, with property investors where uh, their reputations then uh, precede them mm. and uh, agents might very well uh, not 
help mm. you as as much as as you want. So except for the legal and and financial implication, uh, reputation that's one of those moves that I would definitely caution investors against. Mm, absolutely. Oh, thank you, thank you, Selma, for that. Um, Bruno, uh, be passing that ball to you. <laughs> Not much of a ball, but okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, uh, so Selma, spot on with the agents' commission. Um, most of the contracts do do provide for the purchaser to take on some form of liability. And remember, in a lot of cases, if you pay a deposit, you're not getting that deposit back because the agent's going to eat it up. If you haven't paid a deposit, uh, what I do tend to find a lot of times is the seller, with many occasions, the seller won't typically um, look for specific performance, especially because the purchase price tends to be rather large. And because the purchase price is large, um, trying to enforce payment of that large an amount is going to be particularly difficult. And considering that people use banks to get loans, trying to force someone to properly apply to the bank to get a loan uh, and you know, willingly do so, so that the bank will actually fund them is quite difficult. Uh, so it has happened before, especially with guys that have a lot of cash reserves, but typically I, I tend to find that it doesn't happen. The other way around happens. So if you're a buyer and the seller decides all of a sudden they don't want to sell to you anymore. And as per Chris, uh, Chris's example, if, if the seller decides, oh, I found somebody else and they have a higher purchase price, in that instance, an application for specific performance is actually very easy. I mean, we did one now very, very recently. And out of all the applications we do, this is typically the fastest because often you find that there's no excuse. And the reason for that, and this is more kind of context behind the question as opposed to an answer to the question, I find that people don't realize the seriousness of entering into contracts. Or rather, let's put it this way, People, I think the seriousness of OTPs and lease agreements has been diluted because of the measure or the extent to which we see them nowadays. So people come to me and they need to draft a memorandum of incorporation shareholders agreement. That's very serious. They wouldn't sign anything in that document that they're not comfortable with, right? You spend hours and days going through it, going through small little sections about are you willing to give 50% or 51% or and it's a huge thing. But lease agreements and OTPs, they, it, it just gets signed. The, no one reads through it. They just initial and go, initial and go. A lot of people with lease agreements enter into leases. It's a one, and this was before the CPA, I remember this. Uh, obviously with the CPA, things changed. But before the CPA, people never took leases seriously. They signed for a year. And then they just decided, well, I gave proper notice. And I was like, no, you didn't. You signed for a year. There was no notice for 30 days. Uh, you, you didn't give proper notice. And people don't take it as serious. And I think the seriousness of it has been diluted. So going back to Silna's point, OTPs bind you. So once you sign it and somebody accepts it, you're bound by it. Unless it's a suspensive condition that you can use to exit the OTP, they can come after you. And even if the seller doesn't, the agent probably will. So be very, very careful when you sign. Like think twice before you sign. Treat it like you would any other contract. Sure. Now, thank you both for that, uh, that amazing advice. I see that we've, we've reached the, the end of the questions that we had posed to us on the, on the, on the group. Um, if there's anything else you guys maybe want to talk about in the interim, we can, we can discuss it. But I think for now, this has been a, quite, a, quite, a, quite an informative start to the year for, uh, for, for the, the Wednesday webinar. And um, if, if the viewers now have any questions that they would like uh, answered, please do drop those questions on the page, on the uh, Property Alliance page, and uh, we'll get to them. And as you've seen today, Bruno and Selna are more than capable to answer them uh, and also answer questions that have not been asked. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> 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 only attorneys it's a i think i think when we before we, we you know decide what we do i think the question should be can you pull a question out of thin air that was never there and then <laughs> yes okay cool you can be an attorney <laughs> <laughs> no lovely but, but but thank you bruno thank you Solna. uh always uh appreciate listening to you guys and it's it's good that i'm um you know taking this journey with you as well uh, not only to be a viewer, because it's also very informative for me as it is for all the, the viewers watching in. 
Um, so thank you for having me on board. And uh, yeah, here's to a great 2021. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Thanks so much, thank Chris. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye.